Well, good morning, it's Pastor Reg. It is a glorious day here at the Woody Point Studios, and I'm out here with Richie. Uh, Richie, the wonder dog, oh, I don't know if you can see him, his shadow was just there, but he has curled up in the sun and is enjoying life, and so should we all be. I've been talking about Psalm 27 and using it as a launching pad for fears and I shared how I've got a fear of snakes and so on and one of my children uh, said they were disappointed that I didn't talk about my fear of seals uh, but I'm not really afraid of seals I just happen to be aware of how dangerous they are and so I've, I've put on Facebook a picture once I was in Sydney and went you know walking around in Circular Quay where there's the Opera House uh, on the right and the Harbour Bridge on the left and we walked around the Opera House and went down around on the water's edge in between the water and the Opera House and was walking around came across a sign and I've posted a photo of that sign just to prove that I'm not a weirdo for thinking that seals are dangerous um, look look what it says there the warning there's a seal resting in this area so you've got a seal asleep uh, and so what do you need to worry about a sleeping seal well the sign says it says the seal's been assessed and is being monitored there's a ranger type guy there just in case never walk between a seal and the water Seals move fast on the land and may bite if frightened. We're talking about a sleeping seal. Supervise children and restrain pets at all times. Otherwise the seal will get them. And stay your distance at least, cop this, 40 metres from an adult seal and 80 metres from a pup. 80 meters we're talking you know even Usain Bolt <laughs> 80 meters is unbelievable well there you go I'm afraid of seals but even though the principles of faith that we're talking about that will overcome fear I, I believe will work with any fears even uh, legitimate fears of things like seals um, I, I really think that for most of us here, especially here in Australia, we're talking about fears like fears of failure. We're talking about fears of rejection. We're talking about those deep inner kind of fears that seem to occupy our lives. Maybe even uh, the fear of death uh, itself that seems to be something that haunts us as we go through life. So uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about the second principle. The first one I talked about was you need to come to God. You need to cry out to God. You need to bring your fear to God. And we talked about Romans 5 and having peace with God and, and leaning into Him with our fears. And the second one, is we need to be a follower of God. We need to be a disciple of God, or you might want to say, you need to be someone who's prepared to obey God. You see, King David had uh, the king of Israel, Saul and his army hunting him down. He had, he had other nations who were spying and dobbing him in, and it appeared as though he, he was going to be caught and killed. And it's in that context that Psalm 25, 26, 27 is, is, is David's expression of faith in God in the light of the fear of what was about to happen. And so in Psalm 27 is a bit of a, a launching pad for me. Uh, he says in verse 11, Teach me your way, O Lord. 
lead me in a straight path because of my oppressors. He's wanting to follow God, is trusting God, is one where God is leading him along a pathway. And I think that's a good way for us to think as well. But I think uh, sometimes with fears, they are like situational. Like if I bump into a seal, I might go, yikes, I'm in danger. And I might cry out to God then. Really, what we're trying to get a handle on is that sometimes, well, it's not sometimes, our faith needs to be something that's more settled and stable even before you come to the situation where you're afraid. And so you need to be thinking bigger than just the incident that might cause you to cry out to God. I think sometimes we treat God a bit like we treat the doctor. We, we make an appointment, we call out to the doctor when we're sick, when we think that we need one. But the rest of the time, we, we stay away. There's no need for us to go to the doctor. And I fear that many of us have that same kind of uh, thinking with God that we only cry out to him when we need. And some of us in, in extreme cases, we cry out to God when we're in need. We've ignored him all the rest of the time. And we say, why, why aren't you helping me? Why, why aren't you taking away my fears? And then sometimes we even get really angry and cranky and go, well, he didn't even help me when I cried out to him, so he's not even there. When really the problem is me and my relationship with God is so, so distant that he really is like a doctor for me. He's just someone that I call out to when I'm sick and the rest of the time I run my own show. That's, that's not ever going to be, if that's your faith in God, that's never going to be enough for you to have him overcome your fears. I do get staggered, alarmed by how much you hear selfish people who plead with God when they're in need but the rest of the time hardly even believe that he exists and then have the audacity to question God's goodness because he didn't help them. What, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read today Psalm 26, the one before Psalm 27, and you'll hear David's talking with God and asking him for help. He, he's afraid for his life and he, he appeals to God. You, let me read it and you'll get to hear what I mean. This is, this is Psalm 26. It's not very long. Vindicate me, O Lord, for I've led a blameless life. I've trusted in the Lord without wavering. Test me, O Lord, and try me. Examine my heart and my mind, for your love is ever before me, and I walk continually in your truth. I do not sit with deceitful men, nor do I consort with hypocrites. I abhor the assembly of evildoers and refuse to sit with the wicked. I wash my hands in innocence and go about your altar, O Lord, proclaiming aloud your praise and telling of all your wonderful deeds. I love the house where you live, O Lord, the place where your glory dwells. Do not take away my soul along with sinners, my life with bloodthirsty men, in whose hands are wicked schemes, whose right hands are full of bribes. But I lead a blameless life. Redeem me and be merciful to me. My feet stand on level ground in the great assembly. I will praise the Lord. Now, David's appealing to God on the basis of, well, really his obedience. And I think, I think God's gracious and he's merciful to everyone who doesn't deserve it. I don't think we're saying to God when we come and say, God, I'm yours, I've been obedient. We're not saying, 
I've earned that you help me now in my time of fear. We're not talking like that. Uh, we are, we're just saying, God, I've obeyed you. I've walked in your ways and I trust you. Please, will you help me? I don't think that deliverance is simply a reward for obedience. Deliverance comes when we place all that we are at God's feet, irrespective of what we've done. You see, David did sins, and in some cases really bad ones, but he was open to God, he was open to God about his sins and his needs. He brought all of it to God. He didn't just come to God when he needed. His, his faith in God was bigger than just getting God's help when he was in trouble. He trusted God all the time. And it's that faith that's all the time that you find is the one that gets helped when there's a situation for fear. I've always learnt, I've been taught, that faith has three components. There's a, a knowing or an awareness component where you become aware of God and who he is and you, you're, you know about yourself and who you are and your need to connect to him. Then there's a trusting component when on the basis of that awareness you, the creature, trust the creator you see yourself as in need of God and his help and so you actively trust in him and then there's an obedience aspect because of who he is and who you are because of your connection to him you you want to do what he says you want to follow him you want to walk in his paths and that those three things knowing trusting and obeying being a disciple is language that we are used to in the Christian world. I'm going to follow God. I'm going to follow Jesus in my life. And if, if I'm doing that, that's the type of faith that overcomes fear. Sure, there's going to come in life situations where I might be afraid of failing. There might be some huge event that I need to participate in and I'm afraid and I that brings me to God and say God help I need your help but if I'm coming to God blind if I'm coming to God without having been connected with him before at all then that fear I don't think is going to be touched by my faith I'm, I'm treating God like I would a doctor and it's not going to work for me you need to have a settled stable a faith that's prepared to obey and when the chips are down when the fear is dialed up it's that faith that sees you through and so uh, if you're in a situation where things are real bad sometimes stuff happens then uh, you don't want to be, like they say, the person who grabs the Bible off the shelf, <laughs> blows the dust off and then opens it and goes, OK, God, I need your help here. Um, you, we need to be more settled and stable. We need to be a true disciple. We need to be aware of who we are before God and our need of him and walking with him there. They're the faithful types whose fears God relieves. It's that kind of faith that is the opposite of fear. I think that's clear. Well, I've got one more to talk about uh, next time. I think it's going to be good. Uh, remember, I'm talking Psalm 27. Uh, but I'm going to uh, just sh move on now and pray and... Uh, Go and get a mask. Lord, we thank you 
that we can trust you even in our deepest fears. We thank you that well, you've revealed yourself as worthy of our trust in whatever situation we're in. And I pray that everyone who's listening, whatever situation they're in, that you would teach them. I pray that you'd continue to teach me to be a follower, to be a disciple, someone who walks with you in obedience in, in the good times and the bad times. Lord, forgive us for sometimes being people who, who cry out to you just when we're in trouble, but the rest of the time don't even tip our hat towards you. Lord, we, we want to walk with you. We want to acknowledge you as our creator and us as the creatures who need you all the time. Lord, we do pray for our friends in Melbourne and Sydney and the lockdowns and the virus spreading. And we, we pray that you'd be with them, any, anyone with loved ones down there. Pray that you would be with them. We pray too for uh, the virus here, that it won't spread and that our restrictions will be eased soon and we'll be able to get back to some uh, sort of normality. Lord, thank you that you're in control and we can trust you. Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, uh, I'll say goodbye. Don't forget, PJ's on on Wednesday, and I'll see you all next Monday morning, if not at church. God bless.